Welcome to the Haunted Hacker Podcast, and this is uh, February version 3.2. Um, I've already done probably double the amount of podcasts for February that I usually do uh, because I've had so many interesting guests. Uh, so a little bit of news before we get started. I'll be speaking in Atlanta uh, on March 30th um, for the Tech Strong event. I'll be giving a class on how to hack Android phones. Uh, and also to how to subvert um, security controls within mobile mobile devices. Uh, other than that, I don't have a whole lot of uh, good news. Um, just still waiting on the brink to see what happens with Russia and Ukraine uh, and see uh, when we get slammed with uh, infrastructure attacks with ransomware. Uh, so other than that, I don't have anything. And tonight we have Karen Stewart. Um, she is a retired uh, analyst from the NSA. And a friend of a friend, um, Captain Zap, Ian Murphy, who is on the podcast many times so far. Uh, I talk a lot about him. Um, so with that, uh, Karen, I'll let you introduce yourself and kind of talk to us about, you know, where you've, where you've been, what you've done uh, in your story. Thank you very much. And I appreciate being on. I've been trying for a handful of years to try to get this message out. Um, I was an NSA whistleblower and to not really belabor that too much, um, I discovered something that was criminal and uh, very treasonous. And instead of acting on it and investigating, I got stalked, harassed, defamed, and um, fired. So I came to find out after that, that um, the NSA and other federal agencies, and I would imagine some of the bigger companies and things like that use what is called a fusion center for vengeance for hire uh, purposes. Now, what, are, what is a fusion center in case you don't know? After 9-11, Congress demanded NSA, CIA, you know, FBI, et cetera, et cetera, tell them why in the world they missed the fact that 9-11 was going to happen. And they, you know, I listened to a little bit of the testimony and they were pretty much saying, oh, you know, it's that pesky constitution. We just, you know, it just kind of wrecked things for everybody. And I'm just like, oh my God, you know. And, um, so what they did was they said, hey, if we um, create fusion centers in every state where we can take representatives from FBI, CIA, NSA, DEA, whatever, put them in the same building with local law enforcement, um, then we can fuse any type of intelligence that we get from the area, and then we'll be on top of things. Well, that was just right after 9-11. Um, in, uh, I don't know, may, they may have started building fusion centers in 2001, 2002. I'm not quite sure, but uh, in the 20 or so years that they, they've existed, according to articles from all over the United States, they haven't discovered one single terrorist plan or plot, mm -hmm. and they certainly haven't thwarted any. So what the heck are they doing? All right. And Congress has asked them, what are you doing with all this money? Plus now they are up to 79 or 80 fusion centers. So it's more than one per state. And I said, oh my God, we're going to have a fusion center on every corner, you know, and you may have to walk by and get frisked, you know, every, every street corner. So um, what happened after NSA fired me, uh, and I think it happened just before as well, but I hadn't tracked it down as well. Um, was that I started getting stalked and harassed, not by uh, NSA security, which I identified pretty, uh, pretty clearly, were stacking and harassing me because of the whistleblowing. Um, but I started being stalked and harassed by absolute total civilians. And uh, I did my own investigation. I had gone down to Florida. I was in Maryland to work for NSA. And then as I waited for the EEOC uh, lawsuit to be heard, and that takes years, um, I went down to Florida to see if I could help my elderly parents because um, they were in their late 80s and needed some help, you know. So I stayed there, ended up staying there a couple of years because my mother fell twice and needed rehab. So it was a very long process to get her back on her feet. Um, and at that point in time, uh, my lawyer also had subpoenaed, uh, well, had asked for the right to subpoena the identity of a certain NSA manager who I had actually caught in 2006, leaving my house wow. after Trump report what turned out to be, or what it looked like to be a Mossad honeypot blackmail operation. 
Okay, so I get fired for trying to report that and have it investigated. And then this upper NSA manager, SES, SES is pretty high. It's like a flag badger, it's GS-15. So it's very high. So this is the man that was leaving my house. It was broken into. And that was a Saturday. And two days later, I see him outside my office at NSA and he's messing around in the server uh, room. So I go into my uh, office and my computer's the only one down. And it's down all day. As long as the guy's in the server closet, it's down. So I went past him several times and kind of memorized his face because I draw. Mm -hmm. And so I took notes and, and did an outline, did a caricature of him for later. And um, I started to show that picture to say, who is this man? And people got real nervous real nervous and i even noticed that people sometimes if they saw me come and would do this and go hi good morning how are you <laughs> ridiculous absolutely ridiculous um so i knew i was on to something um but i mean nsa basically wanted me to shut up about it and uh i had in the process lost the double promotion and work credit to the honeypot because they wanted to elevate her to higher uh, to a higher echelon so she could blackmail people who were higher up. So um, so I, that's why I ended up filing a lawsuit and why they ended up firing me. But like I said, I had gone down to Florida and we had asked the judge to subpoena the identity of this man that I ended up um, figuring out who he was and we wanted to verify it. And that got ignored. But as soon as we did that, I started being stalked and harassed in Florida. Well, that's 700 plus miles away from Maryland. I'm like, hmm, who are these people? You know, because they seemed like civilian, civilian numbnuts, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so I noticed that they were doing the type of stalking harassment that NSA had exactly. I mean, patterns and practices, absolutely by the book, same type of thing. And so I also noticed that certain people in my parents' neighborhood suddenly were getting new roofs, new carpets, um, all kinds of things that you really don't, I mean, every so often you see somebody in the neighborhood get something like that, it's no big deal. But when you have five or six at once, all getting it, something's going on. So um, I also noticed that there were like a couple people who went door to door and would get invited in and stay for a while and then go to yet another house. And I said, well, that's kind of strange. Um, they weren't in uniform, like they weren't in uh, police uniform or anything. Uh, and after this uh, stalking harassment for, I think that went on from spring to, uh, of spring of 2015 to late 2015, only stalking harassment. And I will have to back up a little bit and say that right when the, just before the stalking harassment started, I was followed around by what appeared to be two teams of, I mean, not at once, they, they varied. Um, mm -hmm. One guy would drive a car, park at the lake where I usually walk my dogs, and another guy would get out of the car and follow me around and take pictures of me. Oh, come on, you know? Um, and so I said, all right, this is suspicious and I bet it has to do with NSA. And um, on one occasion, I turned the tables on him and got his picture and the picture of one of the cars with the license. And, um, the lot, it seemed to basically lead back to um, the Naval Security Group in Pensacola. Hmm. And uh, the Naval Security Group actually has its headquarters on Fort Meade, Maryland, co-located with the National Security Agency. Right. Very interesting. So that started the entire stalking by um, maybe, maybe contractors, maybe Navy, but mostly civilians. Okay. And it, another interesting thing was the night before the stocking, you know, just was ready to go, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I would have two or three people sitting on the road outside the house ready to follow me anywhere I went, you know. And so just the night before that happened, um, there was a recording that was on obviously huge speakers that blew out all across the lake where my parents live. And you could hear it for miles. And it was just a recording of a barrage of big guns, you know, right. that would use battlefield and boom, 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 boom. And I went to the lake and I looked, I said, there's no fireworks. And it does sound like a recording. So I ended up talking to a Leon County Sheriff's Department deputy 
Mm-hmm. And I said, what, what was that? Because it, it was tied to nothing. No 4th of July, no ne- anything. And he said, oh, he said, well, he said, I used to be in the military and we would do that to start a broad scale uh, exercise. I said, oh, really? Okay. And then he go on, went on to, to brag to me. He said, in fact, we have an exercise going on now in town. The National Security Agency flew down here and they flew on cargo planes and had their own Jeep. So they went to the Laura Phipps property just on Lake Jackson. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, that's like spitting distance from my parents. Um, NSA is there. Oh, yeah. And they're doing this big exercise with the FBI and with the Naval Security Group Mm -hmm. and uh, with the Leon County Sheriff's Department and other, you know, like state police and that type of thing. Said, okay, that's very interesting. Didn't tell him anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, name for future reference. And uh, so it seems like what happened was the NSA went to the fusion center and said, oh, we have this terrible problem. This woman is a dangerous terrorist. You're going to need to stalk and harass her and keep an eye on her. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. You know. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, you cannot work for the National Security Agency and have ties to Russia or ties to Iran or, you know, oh, I just do a little drug dealing on the side. You can't do that. <laughs> right. You know. Right. Either their their background uh, investigation is good, or it's or it's crap. I mean, really. Mm. Um, and plus, I had taken uh, reinvestigation psyche valves every five years or so. That's right. required, and I totally passed them every single time. So, am I crazy? That would be interesting to have gone from totally sane to crazy in two point five seconds or something like that. So. Um, I, I noticed that and I said, okay, I'm starting to put this together. Mm-hmm. And fusion centers were involved in the exercise. And um, I ended up watching some of these people go house to house. And by the end of 2015, they were getting frustrated because I wasn't dropping my lawsuit. And I also wasn't being intimidated by hicktards following me around, right. you know? So, um, so I ended up um, saying, okay, it's, at a certain point, I called the FBI and they're like, we're not going to talk to you. So, well, that's not suspicious. Wow. Um, yeah. And I said, well, I can come down and see you in your office. No, you're not allowed in. Oh, really? Okay. Interesting. Um, and I called the FBI in Washington and told them who I was and that there was something suspicious going on. And uh, they said, goodbye, Miss Stewart, and hung up on me after identifying me. Said, okay. All right. So, um, like I said, I kept an eye on what was going on, who was involved, what neighbors were involved. The neighbors um, were also stalking, harassing, but what, what became very interesting was at the end of November in 26, no, 2015, mm. we all start, sudden started getting hit with directed energy weapons. Now, I knew about the existence of large directed energy weapons, like on a battleship, Mm-hmm. Um, the you know, mm-hmm. huge, huge, like for Iraq. Mm-hmm. And I knew we had illegally used them there. We had fried people with the microwave, which New is York. absolutely, New- totally against Geneva Convention. New York okay. as well. They they use those on riot vehicles in New York City. You, I'm sorry, but you cannot give this type of weapon to a policeman. Oh, give me a break, you know. Um, but anyway, I knew they had done that and it was shameful. But uh, then we, we started, I, I, I'm sitting in this house in a Florida neighborhood with two elderly parents and mm-hmm. together we had four dogs. And I had one cat. The third night of the tax, the cat was fried. Okay, that's how bad they were. We ended up calling a, a master electrician. I knew it was coming from outside the house, but we wanted to verify that nothing terrible was going on inside the house. He came out and said, I don't know what the hell is going on, but it's outside the house. There's not anything wrong with any of your interior wiring, but you had damage to the refrigerator, damage to the microwave oven, damage to the dishwasher, a fried router, a fried iPhone. You know, he said, I I can't explain it. I can verify, but I can't explain it. And so I'm thinking, yeah, it's a directed energy weapon, you know, anti-personnel. So, um, like I said, I had kept an eye on a couple of people going house to house and they would stay sometimes for hours or for days at the individual houses. And I noticed the first few attacks were 
only nocturnal. They started in uh, uh, midnight and then ended up uh, turning off at dawn. And I started to go out and watch to see what was going on in the in the woods around the, the neighborhood. And by golly, somebody was getting let off into the woods with some kind of attache case. They would run into the woods. These are nasty woods. You don't want to go in those woods. And then the car would drive and the emanations would start and they wouldn't stop until dawn or just before dawn. Then another car would come by. Somebody would run out from the uh, woods with an attache case, jump in the car and they'd be gone. Well, they were doing that for a while. And then they started sending people around house to house. And then they, these people apparently were paid to host them so they could attack us from line of sight houses, mm. you know, the schedule and the pattern and practices that once they got inside people's homes, then they started hitting us with these directed energy weapons on a schedule, like from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., and then they would up at 20%, and then 10 a.m. to 2 o'clock, and then they would up at 20%. And then by the time you got to midnight or so, it was hellacious. It was absolutely horrible inside the house. Um, I ended up moving to the other side of the house so my parents wouldn't get burned on their faces anymore, because, you know, you could get actual looks like a sunburn, but it wasn't. Um, so I ended up going to the laundry room and trying to sleep there and shield and then trying to figure out what the heck is going on, you know. And um, I ended up tracing the two people who were going house to house. And uh, for a while, they were living in somebody's RV and using the RV engine to hit us with the directed energy weapon. OK, so I said, all right, I'm going to go to I, you know, I tried so hard to educate and get help from the Leon County Sheriff's Department because that was their jurisdiction, even though I had zero uh, confidence in them. But yeah. I ended up going to the Fusion Center and saying I'd like to talk to somebody in the, um, in the domestic terrorism unit. And who did they send out? NSA Not, probably. Uh, well, you no, know, the, the two people going all over the neighborhood, staying with neighbors. What they were doing, bringing them directed energy weapons, teaching them how to use it, telling them what schedule to use it on, and then moving on to another house. You know what I so, find really interesting? I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but what I find really nope. interesting is when we talk about energy weapons and we talk about LRADs and we talk about anti-personnel uh, high-frequency weapons, first of all, the, the government denied it for a very long time that those even existed. And then they denied the fact that they even used them. And, and knew what they were like they thought that this whole directed energy thing you know it's conspiracy but what's funny is when cuba started using it against americans in the embassy all of a sudden directed energy weapons are real and havana syndrome is real because it was a it was a communist state focusing those those lrads or those those high frequency weapons at you know, U.S. personnel. And what I find really intriguing is you mentioned Corey Station, you mentioned, mentioned Pensacola and, and uh, Naval Security Group. I was actually on that base. I, I went to uh, Corey Station for my signal intelligence uh, schooling. And the NSG is really huge on that base. Like when you first go into the gate, the NSG is there. You can't miss it. Huge golf balls. And it's just a really active place. And then you talk about fusion centers. And I've had my own experience with fusion centers. Uh, there's one in Pasadena, Texas, right outside, you know, right on the edge of Houston. And the FBI and the uh, sheriff's office and other intel, other ICs are involved in that fusion center. So I can completely verify that activity because I've dealt with the FBI in Houston as part of the fusion center. And they, they approached me through the sheriff's department and then all of a sudden the FBI got involved. And what I find really interesting, you're talking about the door-to-door, the -door, and it reminds me of when I did my SF-86, and I was going for my top-secret security clearance, and I had to list all my neighbors and, and all my contacts and addresses. But, you know, they never go to the addresses that you list. They always go a door down or the door the other way and really dig into people. And, you know, like, like you mentioned, it's, it's you know, street clothed people. OPM never wears, you know, any kind of badge. I mean, it's just those people are the ones that, that you face on, on that level. And uh, something that really struck me was when you were talking about the psyche valves um, every five or so years, you know, when I took my counterintelligence polygraph for the NSA, 
um, when I was working in SIGINT. You know, that was a very intrusive polygraph. I mean, everybody gets them that, that's working in the intelligence community. And during that polygraph, they, they try to connect you with, you know, outside um, foreign entities. They, they try to assess if you've, you know, compromised a government uh, machine or server. Uh, very specific questions. And you would think once you pass that polygraph that they wouldn't doubt those things, right? But I've seen so many people who have had that level of clearance that I've had, and, and I'm sure that you've had, that ended up getting doubted. And even military members that leave the military with high clearances that get put on watch lists. And I, I think it's just shocking. It, it is. And I have to wonder, because nobody's sane is going to put somebody who's had that type of experience on a watch list unless they're afraid of what the person knows that's bad about the entity. That they, where they were working or someone specific there. Um, like I said, I can name the people who are behind the honeypot operation. And one of them I could prove had family ties to the Israeli military. Mm -hmm. Hmm, could he possibly be open to being a Mossad operative? So, I mean, they went all out to protect themselves and I was absolutely shocked at how many upper level managers wanted to squash this and didn't care. I mean, I had testimony that, oh yeah, she's sleeping her way through the, um, the management at, in the weapons and space directorate where I was working. And I got absolute total confirmation about that. Uh, and that by itself, according to the NSA rules, if you have compromised another person you're working with, let's say there's one married and one has an affair, then the way that they're supposed to deal with it is you call both people in and say, no, you can't do this. One, you can choose be fired right now, or you can or you can call in whatever spouse uh, is involved and tell her or him, I was having an affair. Then you can't be blackmailed, okay? But you don't do it as Rick, you know, uh, and that's what was going on. So, um, like I said, awfully, awfully suspicious, and it looks very much like they were indeed compromised and were more or less working for Mossad. I mean, what the heck, you know? Uh, and I knew Russell Tice, and he reported something that indicated that the Chinese had infiltrated, and he got fired. Really? You know, I mean, you report something that you think is very important, and then you get persecuted. It but anyway, it, it, go ahead. It, it kind of reminds me of 2016 when I was doing some, some work with the agency and uh, they wanted me to focus on a foreign entity that could or couldn't be manipulating certain things in the U.S. And when I finally realized that it wasn't that entity, that it looked like it was internal to the agency, then all of a sudden they went ghost and I leave the country and I get my passport revoked. Um, and, and it, it just came out on the news just recently that Hillary Clinton had had somebody get into Donald Trump's servers and plant evidence of connections with Russia. Uh, and I'm sure that probably stems back to, I don't know, maybe 2016. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that, that people, and I want to I wanna really focus on this for a second. There, there's a lot of things that people, you know, consider conspiracy, right? And when we talk about conspiracy, it's something completely different. Uh, we look at government cover-up. We look at you know, misuse and abuse of power, stuff that's, that's legitimate conspiracy on their side. But I think what's really interesting is they plant people in the public media and different media agencies and these wingnuts who are like out of their mind and spouting conspiracy theory. So once they plant those people and they get that mindset of, okay, these guys are talking about this topic, it can't be true because these guys are just out of their minds, um, Alex Jones being one of them. And so when you or I say, okay, there's something going on here, and I think somebody needs to look into it, all of a sudden we get grouped with the likes of Alex Jones and conspiracy theories. But what's funny is, you know, as time passes by and, you know, things kind of settle down, then all of a sudden information and data comes to the surface that, hey, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't really a conspiracy theory. I mean, a perfect example was Cuba and the directed injury weapons there. And for the longest time, people were like, oh, that's conspiracy, conspiracy. 
um, Cuba was saying, oh, it's a conspiracy. But what was funny was the U.S. actually acknowledged that they were, ha- that they were had an effect from those energy weapons on government employees. And that to me was shocking because they're willing to admit that, but they still say, oh, the use of high energy weapons against U.S. citizens, that's a conspiracy theory. Well, you know, come on, let's look at Cuba and let's look at what we did with uh, anti-personnel in Iraq and the big dishes on, on the, the SUVs and the Humvees in New York for riot control. Uh, same thing. And for those of you who don't know it, what high energy directed directed energy weapons are when I speak about LRAD, it's such a high frequency that when that dish is pumped up and the amps go up and that energy and that RF go out, it literally will disable somebody. They will bend over and start puking. I mean, it, it's it's a debilitator. And uh, for the longest time, we, we denied the use of those uh, until it came out in Iraq that we we're actually using those against riot control. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of theories floating around. There's people don't know how the DIA work. They don't know how NSA works. Um, and there's a reason why they keep those agencies secret because they don't always follow the rules. Um, I just talked to Kurt Swiestack, who is former FBI, and he is now a big, uh, supporter for whistleblowers in the FBI and represents them as a lawyer because of what happened to him. And so that level of corruption exists every day. And people and U.S. citizens are, are led to believe that, that it's not really true, that's conspiracy. Take Wormwood, for, for example. Everybody thought that was a conspiracy. Oh, the CIA would never give people or, or targets LSD. Come to find out, it's truth. Um, so, you know, the things you're telling me, I can completely relate to because I've been down that road. I've seen how ICs work. I know what we have to do to get into the IC, and I know what goes on. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a complete shame that people deal with that, especially someone who's trying to support the government for, what, 28 years and retired. Um, it's an absolute shame. And I don't know at what point we're going to look back and say, you know what, this was the demise of the U.S. government, and this is why we fell as an empire, because we could not maintain a level of checks and balances. And people, people and, and government agencies ran awry. I mean, do you, do you think that's where we're headed as a nation? Do you think that that's going to be our demise? Uh, I think everything is infiltrated. Everything. I mean, um, I, I've heard people talk about and one specific gentleman saying, well, you know, that drug cartels send people to infiltrate the Department of Homeland Security. I'm like, oh, God, I guess so. I guess so. And then other people are talking about the Chinese and Iranian people who have infiltrated our government. Um, and what you look at in the headlines is people selling us out right and left, you know. Um, yes, we are headed for destruction, you know, from our leadership that is selling us out and saying, well, you know, I'll be okay. I just have to, you know, sell out these other bozos. Um, but I will give you one alternate theory on the attacks on the diplomats in China and, well, uh, China and Cuba. Mm-hmm. I sat there thinking, okay. Nikola Tesla started to invent this type of thing in the early, if not late 1800s. He died in the early 20th, 20th century. The FBI got a hold of all of his notes. Destroyed them. These weapons have been developed for being, uh, being developed for 60 years, and they didn't know about them, and they thought maybe they were crickets. I don't think so. Sonic crickets in Cuba. That's a heck of a weapon, I'll tell you. But... Um, and I sat there thinking, you know, this happened after Trump got in. Trump probably was going to normalize and better relations with Cuba. He was going to normalize or at least try to better relations with China. And if you're CIA and you're using these two places to run uh, drugs or human trafficking or things outside the U.S. realm of watching you, you don't want anything normalized. So why don't you take the weapons and turn it on your own people? so that you can screw up relations with these two countries at least. That's a theory. Mm. I, I don't personally believe that the Cubans turned it on our people. And I don't personally believe the Chinese turned it on our people. I think it was CIA, but I can't prove it. That's my opinion, you know. I, I can't tell you that the CIA does have interests still in China. Um, and I worked for a 
former um, CIA field, field manager, field officer. Um, last name is Susong. And he was based in Northern Africa and Morocco. And when I was working for him, one of the first offices this Dallas-based intelligence company opened was in Beijing. And they knew the, the chief of police in Beijing, went and met with him and set ground and, and opened up an office in Beijing. Um, this intelligence company was, was built and developed and ended up being sold off to a cybersecurity company. Um, they had boots on the ground in I don't know how many foreign countries. And I was working there and, and kind of leading the malware reverse reversal lab and kind of vulnerability uh, research. And um, we had an individual that we pulled out of prison um, and made him sort of an asset and put him in a foreign country. And this is where things got a little weird for me uh, when, it come to, when it came to working for intelligence companies. I, I was kind of a handler for this guy and you know he was conversing back and forth. And he started to worry if we were a three-letter agency. You know, why would we need this information? Why can't you talk about this? Who do you work for? What three-letter agency are you? And as soon as I reported this information, they, the intelligence company cut ties with them and left him in that country, the country where he was wanted by organized criminals. Oh. Um, and I went home and I had a conversation with a good friend of mine on the East Coast through my internet connection that I paid for, through my computer that had nothing to do with the company. And the next morning when I went into the office, they had the dialogue between me and my friend on the East Coast. And at that point, I knew what was going on. And I had to go through the same issue. You know, I had people that were following me. I had to file a cease and desist uh, through a lawyer in Dallas uh, for them to stop surveillance. They were showing up uh, at different places that I would work, wanting demos and just kind of like showing their face like, hey, we're still here type thing. Uh, it was more of an intimidation tactic. And uh, it was really frustrating. But eventually, you know, that kind of died down. Um, but I didn't stop talking about it because I wanted people to know that, you know, when you deal with people like the CIA and specific indiv individuals, and it's not everybody in the CIA that's that way, but when you deal with somebody who's corrupt, has a, has a defunct mind, they're going to do manipulative things and, and harass you and do things that they know is powerful, right? But then you have people who walk the line and, and who really want to, to help the country. Um, I have a, a friend of mine who's former CIA, and he worked in a technology office, and he's just a great guy um, and follows the rules and, and is there to help me whenever I need help as far as technology goes and trying to, to make my ideas you know, fruitful. Great guy. But I have to say that, that he's rare. Um, most of the people I've ran into in the different agencies if you're not part of their club or if you don't follow the company, the company line, uh, you end up being put on a list and, and kind of treated differently. And, and, and it ends up becoming harassment. And, uh, you know, we've seen it, corruption within the government, you know, being infiltrated. You know, Robert Hansen, who leaked secrets to the Russians, you know, it, these are paramount cases that set a precedence. And it happens every day. And that's what people don't understand is our government is full of plants and information that, that we find secretive to protect not only servicemen, but, but civilians alike is being leaked to the wrong hands. And I don't know what it's going to take to fix that. I mean, you look at Snowden, right? Snowden got ousted from the country, put on a list. They wanted to kill this guy because he leaked information from X key score. So we all knew what was going on with XK score way before he leaked it. We knew that, that the NSA was, was watching people and tapping phone calls. It was no huge surprise. But what really shocked me was even after he was out of the country in Russia and the appeals court identified X key score as illegal process and against the constitution, they didn't pardon him. He's still in Russia. He can't come home. And, but this is a government operation that has been deemed illegal, but yet he's still treated like a criminal. I mean, who's the real criminal in this situation, right? I agree. And, and I've said he can't come home. I don't care if they pardon him or not, because NSA will kill him with directed energy weapons. They'll or, just murder him. Or the DIA. The DIA or is the very, very good at covert operations and clandestine operations. Um, and there, a lot of people don't understand, too, is that the FBI and the CIA are not the only agencies that do clandestine operations.
operations. You have the you have the DIA. You have naval intelligence. You have a lot of people who practice these clandestine operations, not just against foreigners, but against their own assets that have gone rogue or what they consider rogue. Or people, people who have the goods on them that they have turned, um, you know, this directorate or something isn't is basically a, a crime gang. You know, when you have all the different clearances and the people next door, you don't know what they do. You assume that maybe they are uh, analyzing Russian submarines, but no, they're running damn drugs. You know, and they're just saying, oh, "Okay, we're top secret," you know, Millhouse or something. No, you're not. You're a drug runner. You know, and you're doing it under cover of your job. So the, it becomes very difficult because you have people out there on the line doing a real job, and then you have scumbags hiding behind us and then ruining our lives if we trip upon something and say, well, what is this? Yeah, you know? I mean, let's, let's look at that movie um, American Made with Tom Cruise and how the government helped him set up his operation. But what happened to him when he went, went rogue? I mean, they tracked him down, even though he was still doing the things that they had set him up to do, they went after him. And there, there's so many cases of that where, you know, take, take my lawyer, for instance, that helped me with, with my cybercrime issue. There was a CIA asset um, that was running explosives to Libya uh, and got put in prison. Mm -hmm. And in front of the court, he said, I work for the CIA. This was authorized. And the CIA said, we, don't, we have no idea who this guy is. They sent him to prison for over 20 years. My lawyer, who was CIA, you know, retired CIA, and still had a, a clearance to get into Langley, went and pulled all the documentation from that operation and proved that he was an asset and got him out of prison. I think he lived for maybe a couple of years later and passed away. But here's a guy that spent many years in prison because the government screwed him over because he was an asset. He, he didn't have the direct connection. He wasn't part of the good old boy network. So as soon as, as soon as he got caught, oh, hey, we don't know him. And they obviously did. And that happens every day. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I believe it. Absolutely believe it. I mean, they will stab anybody in the back. I mean, with the directed energy weapons there, I mean, I have gotten a lot of health issues. I mean, uh, like I told you, when I went down to visit my parents there in the late 80s, they're in their mid to early 90s now. I have damn good genes. You know, by accident, I have damn good genes. But I went my entire life with, with no problems. I mean, every so often a headache, you know. But when they started hitting me with directed energy weapons, oh my gosh, scarred retinas. How do you get scarred retinas? Um, bleeding in the brain, blood clots flowing down my throat, uh, desiccated heart, uh, all kinds of stuff that boom, just kind of happened with the... Um, uh, with the exposure to these weapons. And uh, I mean, it's a slow kill. It's basically what they're doing is they're slow killing you. I mean, I don't, I don't have any uh, idea that I'm going to live into my 90s. I just, I mean, 65 now, I don't know if that I'm going to live into my 70s, you know, because these things are horrid. And um, they're hitting me right now for the past several months with radio frequency. Well, radio frequency, like I said, will desiccate your heart mm. and it will give you COVID. I mean, not COVID, um, COPD. Mm. So guess what my last two pets died from? Destroyed lungs, destroyed heart. Wow. Radio frequency, okay? And I'm getting the same. So they pay nitwit neighbors telling them, and you know, I've heard twice now, oh, she's a pedophile. Really? <laughs> really? You know? <sighs> Because they don't have anything on me because I haven't done anything wrong. And I tell people, I said, it's worse, the better a person you are, the more depraved their accusations get. You know, I mean, they seem to be going to neighbors saying, well, she did this or she did that. We can't possibly use the law to arrest her. Why? But you have to kill her for us. Why? You know, and people, it doesn't occur to them that maybe that's unconstitutional, that's unfair, that's unjust, mm -hmm. that um, if I had done something actually wrong, why would I not be arrested and charges pressed against me and go to prison? Why would you kill someone in their house? And yeah. I'm just, I'm stupefied by the level of non-intelligence mm -hmm. in the average American, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and here's, here's one thing I want people to think about, right? 
so for the longest time, we knew that the CIA was, was carrying out assassinations on different people. Um, and they were falling ill from these weird effects. Uh, let's take the heart attack, for instance, right? There was some people that were assassinated and all they could find was, oh, it, it, it was natural causes. They died of heart failure. People, completely healthy people died of heart failure. And what did we find out years later? That there was a heart attack gun that the CIA had developed and admitted to. And it yeah. literally sent people into coronary, coronary failure. Um, you have things like that. Of course, I, I spoke about Wormwood and, and how that was used against the, the scientists that helped them develop that, that technique. Uh, he ended up throwing himself out of a, out of a hotel window um, mm -hmm. and later on finding that he wasn't thrown, that the CIA was actually involved. Um, I mean, there's a lot of that that goes on. And, you know, I don't mind when people say, oh, that's, you know, you're wearing a tinfoil hat. Because then I break it down and I put, put the data in front of them and say, you know, let's talk about the heart attack gun. You know, that is, that's an admitted weapon the CIA used at that time. You know, let's look at Wormwood. Let's look at historical precedents that, that shows the covert and clandestine weapons that they used against civilians. It's, it's legit. I mean, especially with Wormwood, you know, when I speak a lot about that because CIA used to test that on people that, that they would meet in bars. Not in Russia, not in China, <laughs> but in the U.S., you know, We're, and it, American yeah. is very expendable. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the way they look at it. And, you know, working in intelligence for many years, it's like, I know what we're capable of as far as good goes. And I know what we're capable of as far as bad and corruption goes, because I've seen both sides of it. Uh, and it leaks into business because those agents or, or, or those operatives, when they leave those services, they go into the public service and they go into commercial entities. They go in big corporations and that same level of corruption follows them. And those companies become assets to the agencies. And it's just, it, it's really disgusting. I think because a lot of the, a lot of the CIA agents that I've known in the past um, have worked at major corporations and technology firms um, as a CIA operative, as a cover, that was their cover was working as a technologist uh, and the stuff that I've seen. But, you know, and you talk about assassinations and tinfoil hats and stuff, you know, let's talk about Bill and Hillary Clinton, you know, with the Arkansas mafia and people committing suicide all around them. You know, there, there's just so many things that, that people don't really sit down and think about and really dig into and try to find real data. Uh, and it's just a shame. You know, a lot of people will blow it off as conspiracy, but it's real. It's real and it's here. Well, the, the bad thing is that, yeah, they treat their own people like this, and then they go out and do random things to innocent people. But what really horrified me when I got into investigating Fusion Center was I started uh, giving interviews and doing, you know, like uh, every so often somebody would write some kind of article or something, and I, and I would get my, I would put my um, contact info, you know. I started getting calls and emails from hundreds of people who were, civilians who had been targeted by the fusion centers and they had gone around telling these people's neighbors that they were spies, they were pedophiles, they were eaters, they were drug dealers. And I'm like, why would you do that? And it, it looks to me like to keep their budget, they had to come up with millions of terrorists inside the United States and we had hoovered in so many Muslims 9-11. I mean, you know, I, I can, I, in my mind, I just really see kind of people walking down the streets of Cairo and having our people come Shanghai them and you're going to be an immigrant, you know, and throw them into the United States because they wanted a pool of people. They could say, well, we have to watch these people because they're Muslims. Well, the Muslims were happy as can be to be here and be free and do what they want. And there weren't any terrorists. Mm. So, hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to have to Wanda Jones and Larry Smith, and we're gonna put them on the watch list. And then we're just gonna get all these other people. And what, it, what I found out from one story was the IRS had set their sights on a man who had a drywall company. It was a very good company. It was doing very well. And they wanted to rip him off. And so they went to the fusion center and said, okay, we need um, uh, Joe Brown. We wanna get this kind of money. 
come in, but he hasn't done anything wrong. But we need you to fabricate a dossier that we can give to the FBI. The FBI can take it in front of the FISA court and say, looks like he's, you know, mingling with, uh, uh, you know, Mexican Martians or something. And so they made up this dossier and the Fusion Center ran with it, trying to say, oh, you know, you, we find you that you're suspicious and we may want to, you know, do away with your business. And the IRS is like, well, if you just pay this fine, we can, I'm sure we can smooth it out. And they, they counted on intimidating the guy and forcing him to pay money he didn't owe them, but he got a lawyer instead. And I think that was Bernhardt in, in Texas. And in discovery, they found out about the false dossier. And I said, they're making false dossiers uh, against two, three million people inside the United States to take to the idiot FISA court and have them issue surveillance warrants, warrants, and then the surveillance equipment is, guess what? Directed energy weapons. They're not watching you, they're cooking you, you know? And um, it, it, it's all for their budget. And, it, and I, before I said, this is where, you know, taking the mother who says, I don't want my child taught this in school and mixing her with terrorists. And all of a sudden you've got what the DHS is really going for is to make every single person in the United States, not on their payroll, a terrorist. That goes back to the, I, I equate all of this back to the originating law that was passed, you know, the originating act that was passed by Congress and by the executive branch. And that would have been the Patriot Act. Um, the Patriot Act gave people power to turn their neighbors into terrorists. Um, you know, I, I know from, from experience, I, I lived close to the Fusion Center in Houston, and I talked about how they approached me about a Pakistani uh, family who lived across the street. And it wasn't about being a terrorist. It, it wasn't about, you know, potential connections to terrorists or, or terrorist ties. It was about the fact that they had expensive cars in the driveway and they had a large number of them. Well, they were selling them. You know, there may have been some, some covertness on the Pakistani part, but really what, what did they have to go by besides what, you know, trying to quiz me what I saw going on? Um, and again, they were Muslim. And I lived, you know, not even five miles from one of the biggest mosques in Texas. And, you know, they didn't mess with them. They came knocking on my door. You know, they, 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 don't, want, they don't want them because it's, it's hard to prove a case against them. But it's a lot easier to, to look at the tax returns and whatnot of an American citizen and say, oh, well, you know, I need to put you on the OFAC list, which was what I was on at one point, because I was potentially connected to a cyber to, to a terrorist organization, which I later found out was a, a hacktivist group, um, which I thought was really funny. So you're going to classify me as a terrorist and you put me on the OFAC list, even though I'm domestic and, and we don't have any terrorist ties, uh, but they, they stretch that rule because it's a rule that they can manipulate. And it's, it's a rule that they can control. And when you look at corruption, you know, let's take FBI corruption for a second. You know, when you look at the history of corruption with the FBI, I mean, it goes all the way back to the founder of the FBI, Hoover himself. You know, they, they had blackmail against him because they knew he was a crossdresser. You know, he, he was vulnerable in that situation. So that corruption has been there from the beginning of these entities. It's, it's bred in that corruption. And I just, you know, I don't think that we're on a good track, you know, especially when I look at what's going on in Ukraine and Russia and the U.S. government and Biden is making threats. And they're saying that, you know, we're here to protect the Ukrainians. This is a humanitarian effort. It's not a humanitarian effort. It's a fight over natural gas pipelines. Just like it was in Iraq, it wasn't trying to free Iraqi people. It was trying to get a percentage of the oil pipeline into war reparations. And, you know, when I talk about war reparations, people, people's eyes get glazed over. And I'm like, yeah, people pay us for what we do during war. That's their way of giving it back. And most of the time, we're after natural resources. You know, you wonder why we go into a specific country and fight a war. It's not about freedom. It's not about democracy. Those people who care less about democracy. It's about that pipeline or that natural resources underground. That's what we're after. So, I mean, that corruption, I think, is going to continue on. I don't see any end in sight. Um, and I think that China and Russia is that balancing act, right? I think that they're to the point where they've had enough. And I think American citizens, once they really open their eyes 
if they can, I think they're going to see what's going on and the game is played. And just like every empire that, you know, the cycle runs about 254 years, we're real close to that. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. I mean, I've rethought Russia. I saw Putin uh, Mm -hmm. in an interview and he was saying, we don't want to develop uh, electromagnetic weapons, but the United States Mm -hmm. keeps going with this weaponry. We think nuclear is just a, as good a deterrent as you can get. Mm-hmm. We, we need to keep going with electromagnetic weapons that really you don't have a deterrent because you can use that weapon against whatever city, kill everything in it, including the roaches that would have survived a nuclear mm-hmm. attack, um, and just replace it with your own people. You haven't damaged any kind of in- infrastructure. You just kind of... Um, raided i mean you know like the bug spray raid mm-hmm. um you've just kind of sprayed it kill the people and you go in and take over the you know the city and the and the resources so russia had said knock it off with electromagnetic weapons research we don't want to be in this weapons race you know now china is entirely different because china has poisoned themselves to the point that they're eating heavy metals and they, they want to extinguish other people and just move into their land. I think Rush is pretty fine. Like, you know, why don't you guys uh, leave us alone? Yeah. You know, we're happy. Leave us alone. You know, but Ch- China to me is a different story. Um, they're very highly predatory. They're not, I, I think they feel like they can't correct their country. They have the least amount of potable water and it is polluted beyond imagination. We have the most amount, count, counting Canada especially, we have the most amount of potable water and we have vast ranges of you know cat you know uh basically farmland and uh, ranges for cattle and all that kind of stuff and china says we want that country mm-hmm. you know so t- totally different um uh aspects to to these countries what they want and what they don't want um but i am concerned that uh, the chinese will keep coming and that they have a friend in one certain party much more so than we even want to admit. And the other party is kind of uh, dull-witted and they don't see anything. What's the yeah. problem, you know? So that doesn't help us at all, you know? So we do have a problem from what we've put into power. And unfortunately, a lot of the time they say, your government reflects your society. Well, that's bad. Right. It's frightening. It's really frightening. <laughs> But I always say that the 90% of U.S. citizens or Americans, as long as they get their Starbucks every morning and can go shop at Target, they could give a shit less what goes on. And they turn on the TV to Fox News or CNN and get spoon-fed what the news media and what the government wants them to believe. Even though, you know, working in intelligence, you and I both know, when we go into another country during conflict, what we see on Fox News is completely different than what we're seeing on the ground. Uh, and that's been a campaign and propaganda machine forever. I mean, I just watched uh, Dr. Zivago uh, last night, um, three hour movie about the Russian Revolution and uh, the Civil War and the way that the U.S., I guess, media or, or movie machine has used that as propaganda against Russia. I mean, the book was even banned in Russia when the book was, was written um, because of the way that they portrayed the Russians. Uh, so this has been a silent battle for a very long time. But Karen, I really appreciate you being on the show. I, I hope people take some of this and really start to think about it. Even if they don't believe it 100%, just think about it. Just start a discussion. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that eventually, you know, this harassment will stop for you. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I know firsthand how stressful it can be when you can't get a bank account. When you, when you can't own a house, uh, you know, it's, it's hard and you feel like less of a citizen and they, they do that. And I call the process making you a ghost uh, yeah. and they're, they're very effective at that, but I, I appreciate okay. it. And this will be going up on the internet and I don't care how many people it shocks because I think people need to know your story and they need to know the real data and the science behind what's going on. Well, they, they need to know the Fusion Center could be coming after them next for no damn reason. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. They need, they need to get interested in having all this, this, this entire program shut down. Yep, I agree. Well, thank you for coming on, and I'd like to have you on again real soon and you know, catch up on what we're doing. Um, and thank you for supporting the podcast. And with that, I'll go ahead and sign off. And, you know, good luck to you, and I wish you the best. Lovely to have met you and spoken with you. You take care. You too.